Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the MMA Huddle, and you're joined by Big Willie Style and myself, as always. Thank you all for tuning in. Again, if you've not subscribed, we are going to hit it and say it every time. Subscribe button down below. If you hit the notification little bell, it will let you know when we post our podcast. Also, there is interviews to watch out for, which... UFC fighters are on there of late, because obviously that's the only kind of cards that are going down. I have seen Brave FC have announced the card in August, and the U- and the in the UK they're doing a drive-in style fight live stream and fight card. So the you know, MMA is picking up around the the world, so to speak, in its own way. So that's that's good to see. Um, but guys, right now, if you hit that subscribe button, it'll be a massive help. Hit the like button if you're watching the video too. We're going to obviously go and break down the Qatar and Ige fight card. Uh, once we've done that, we're going to go into the bets. We're doing a little condensed version this week, only because we've got two fight cards in a week. So it's like a double bubble, quick hit. So we're just going to go through these fights, break them down a little bit quicker than we do normally. So don't fear, it's not that we're skipping on fights and not paying attention to them. It's just a time constraint to get everything edited and uploaded in time for uh, content. All right, so Will, first and foremost... Do you enjoy 251, my friend? The first Fight Island event, let's say. Yeah, I did. I, did, I was really... Um, I, I, I think there was a few kind of really bad kind of judging... Uh, judges, kind of scorecards that kind of went down last night and some decisions I didn't particularly agree with, but I was happy to see uh, Peter Yan because I'm such a big fan of his. I'm happy he got his belt. Uh, I think they've got a star in Hebas. I think they've got a star in this... Chaska as well so uh, all in all I think it was a really really solid fight card throughout and um, like I said I'm just really excited for these back to back to back cards as much work as it is and looking into it and making podcasts and doing this it's they're solid solid cards so I'm uh, looking forward to talking about this one as well yeah bro so we're going to jump straight into it uh, we've got the listing so far that we have at the present time uh, light heavyweight fight kickoff uh, two newbies uh, Kenneth Berg and Jorge or George uh, Gonzalez will start us off what's your thoughts on this one yeah I only watched two fights on Gonzalez this morning and it uh, uh, doesn't look good he, he looks kind of ropey and when you look at the record of the guys who he's fighting that like they're 0 and 4 0 and 5 and like uh, two and two, they're, they're not good records at all. Kenneth Berg, I knew about as soon as I heard his name. I was like, all oh, right, I know who he is. He fought Norman Perezi on Cage Warriors, and he fought in the Dana White Contender Series. So the UFC, UFC have had their eye on him a little bit. So to throw him in here on a short notice, kind of fight. This is what the second time I think he's been matched up with someone in this card. I think he's got a massive advantage if this fight hits the ground. I think he can wreck him down there actually. Um, so I, I, I'm going to go. I'm going to go with Kenneth Berg just based on I've seen more of him and I think that he's got something there which he can absolutely t- win the fight on and just take him to the ground, submit him, maybe even TKO him, just whatever. But I- I've got him pretty handily in that fight there. Yeah, I'm with you on that, Will. I'm going with Kenneth too. I think he can just get the takedowns. I think you'll- I'd be surprised if he even wants to stand the fight on the- in the fight. That's where Jorge's kind of won some of his fights with the hands like he stopped Luke Barnett as well clipped Luke Barnett um, in I think it was ACB I think it was off the top of my head or something like that um, so he has got some power in his hands but skill set wise he's it is a bit questionable some of the some of the opponents he's had so maybe he looks a lot better than he is but I'm thinking Kenneth he does it in his fights anyway Kenneth kind of goes for the grappling aspect he's a strong light heavyweight he's a big light heavyweight I think he'll just cl- charge the fight down get to the cage and get on top, and he's got good ground and power. He's got a good top game, kind of. So, that is that's definitely like kind of his bread and butter. Uh, again, I think Kenneth's a little bit green, but um, I think he should come through this and get the get the win on his debut. Uh, next up, we have in the bantamweight division a fight that I'm kind of excited about. Now, if I'm not lazy and I actually bother, there'll be a little eye that pops up on this screen that will show you the Jack Shaw interview that I did. Uh, if I'm lazy and I can't be bothered because late at night when I'm editing this, it's because I didn't do that. But Jack Shaw and Aaron Phillips are facing each other. Uh, Aaron Phillips coming in, back into the UFC. He was in the UFC, I think it was like five years ago, something crazy like that. Uh, then he had, a, he had a fight after that where he lost the decision, I think, and then he had a, f- a three-year break. He just 
went off. I'm not sure what the in, I'm not sure what the story was for it. I'm sure there's an interview where he got asked it. I didn't. I haven't had a chance to even watch any of that. I haven't had a chance to look at any interviews because I've been either interviewing people myself or doing tape studies. That many fights going on. But um, with him as a fighter, when you watch him these days after after he came back, some of the, his opponents weren't overly impressive. But he's got a, he's got technically he's got a nice uh, like kind of head, left head kick and the body kicks aren't too bad. Uh, the fight against uh, Frank and Swell, 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 I think it was. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, they were they were fights to, to kind of look out for if you want to watch them yourself. He can he has got a bit of grappling on him, but I think mate. Jack Shaw should use the wrestling here. I think on the feet, he, it will be a decent kind of battle on striking, but I think Jackie has got solid wrestling here. He should be able to get the fight to the ground and out grapple this Aaron Phillips, and he really should put him away. I think Jack Shaw with a submission or a rear naked choke would not be a shock. I think Jack Shoney can grapple against the guys from over the seas, and I think he, he should be able to do the same here again. Yeah, I, uh, I had this fight, I think we've heard a couple of times that Jack's had that kind of numerous opponents yeah. for this kind of fight card and they've pulled out for one way or another, getting a virus or um, whatever it may be. Um, but to me, this is a Jack Shaw is going to he's going to roll here. I think Aaron Phillips, I heard that name and I was like where have I heard that name? And I was like Jesus, I was like, I broke down this guy's fights from six years ago and like um, and he lost to Matt Obar, he lost to Sam Cecilia, uh, well, I think he fought Chris Gutierrez and he actually broke his leg in that fight and he took it two, two and a half years to re- kind of recuperate that leg so I think that was the reason he was out um, but I've watched his last couple of fights he, he was just getting taken down too easily for my liking um, and against someone like Jack Shaw who times his shots well I think he's one of the, one of the, the really best guys that kind of take in the back and once he takes the back he locks you in and he, he finds a submission Guy's undefeated through his amateurs, his pro career, fought for Cage Warriors, won the belt, defended the belt, fought in front of big crowds in front of his home country, um, and now he's got his own gym, where probably, pretty much most things will be centred around him, and you get people like he's sparring with Brett Jones, who's another guy in that division. Um, he's joined the team. He's, he's yeah, trained, yeah. It's, it's all that. I was watching just a, one or two interviews from earlier on. Uh, that, that's great to have... Um, I think he he rules here and he kind of runs. I don't want to say runs through Aaron Phillips, but I think he, um, I think he wins this via submission. I, I've got him via rear naked choke. Okay, nice. Next up, bro, in the women's flyweight division. Now, Diana Bell Bitter, not Bell Vita, not Bell Bitter, Bell Bitter, against Liana Joe Dewar. Uh I think this is a, a pretty. A pretty conclusive fight for me. I think Diana should be able to get the victory in this one. Uh, I think her aggressive striking, and I think she's got a bit more pop than Liana. Outside of the UFC, obviously Liana's debut, I thought she was super, really gun shy. She wasn't very fluid with the striking, and I thought she wasn't too strong in the clinch. But for me, Diana, I think out of the pair of them, has got a bit more aggression on the striking side of things, and can maybe overwhelm Liana in the fight. Um, so I, 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 watching it back, I just kind of thought maybe was the jitters that got Liana in the debut. Maybe she didn't look too good. Um, I'm not. I, is she the one that we think she got signed by the UFC because of her Instagram rating? She got like a, quite a few Instagram followers. I think she, it might be in her. Um, not that I'm saying the UFC sign people because of social media um, kind of attention, but uh, I just didn't. I wasn't overly impressed by Liana out prior to her debut from the girl she, she fought outside of it. Um, I thought Diana when she fought her fight was she fought Molly McCann. I thought she didn't. I thought she was all right. If I'm honest, I thought she did okay. Um, but I, I'm, I'm going. With, I'm going with Diana on this one. I think. Uh, I think she should be able to stop the fight potentially against Liana. Yeah, low level MMA, uh, women's yeah. MMA. I'm just like, oof. It's, it's a striker v grappler kind of fight as well. You've got Belbita, who is the striker, and Jojo is the grappler. And the fights that you watch at Jojo, if she gets the fights there, she can she can be fairly dominant, and she can nearly get um, she she can get some wins through that. She did get the fight to the ground a couple of times against Sarah Morris, and she is easy to take down. I think there's going to be a lot of output from Belbita, um, but I think Jojo is going to get to the ground. And I think she's, she has got an opportunity to submit. We've seen that against Molly McCann. That Molly's not known as a grappler now, and she's she's definitely making improvements and she's evolving into a better fighter. 
but uh, Molly's like getting taken down like what five times mm. in that spot there is a little bit can, can a concern for me if Joe Drew can get there I think she can win I've got zero confidence that she can actually win but I'll, I'll take it I'll, I'll go with the underdog in this spot here but if, if it stays predominantly on the feet Bill B I'll just kind of rip her up a little bit but uh, I can't say I'm uh, overly confident in Joe Drew but I'll, I'll take her for a, for a win there and next up we have in the light heavyweight division Two more debuts. Uh, we got Medeskis Berkakus against Andreas Michelidis. Right, so that's best you're getting out of that. Um, yeah, Will, what are you looking at this one? Yeah, like I said, I kind of know who Medestas is because he came through Cage Warriors and you kind of have a recollection, a recollection of fighters, but you kind of watch them in the fights. You're like, you forget about guys and. Uh, so I went back this morning and I was watching him and I was like, honestly, I wasn't super impressed with what I seen in certain parts of his game, but other parts I thought were decent and that he's got stuff to work with there. So his striking, I think, is very solid. It's very fast. It's very crisp. And I love his one-two. Uh, and I, I like how he follows that up with a left high kick as well. So he, he's got some devastating strikes there. What I will say is I think he's got very bad takedown defence. Every fight I seem to watch, he was getting taken down and controlled on numerous occasions as well. But I'll give him credit, he worked his way back to his feet. Um, and once he was in open space, he, he could kind of determine what, what was going on in the fight with his striking. But then he'd clinch up again and he'd get taken down again. Then I watched Michaelides, who I kind of know of a little bit. Um, he fought over in Russia. I think I watched one of his Russian fights at the time. Went back and watched a couple of fights there. And there's a couple of very, very scrappy fights. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's one against Minev in there that, which is super scary like both guys just gas Crazy. badly uh, and the, 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 they're literally just pawing each other they're not even the, the strikes aren't even that hard it's just a gas job um, and then he beat Marcel Fortuna a former UFC vet kind of spin kick caught him in the side of the head followed up with some um, ground and pound and then he fought a guy in the kind of Miami kind of fight scene there so He's a natural 185er coming up here, so he'll maybe not have to cut as much weight. He'll be definitely undersized in this fight. Um, I think if he, I think he could get takedowns. Honestly, I think he really could. But I think in the open space, I think Bukowski is maybe going to kind of piece him up a little bit. But uh, not confident in this one either. But I'm going to take Bukowski via TKO. Yeah, it's it's one of them ones where you think Andres is going to drop down to middleweight after this fight because uh, he's fought predominantly middleweight and it's it's a far better outfit for him 20 pounds is huge um andrea's obviously coming in as a middleweight will feel a lot more comfortable with that but a light heavyweight he's probably even going to be giving up 20 to 25 pounds in this fight he might try to use speed but i think he throws he like like you said will that some of the fights he's had he throws really heavy in his strikes um got uber cocky in the minute fight in that bout he was super cocky as well like just kept saying bring it on he kept getting clipped um, was, he's got a not bad top game, so like you say, well, if he does get a takedown, he, he can have a good hot, a good top game. He's got he's quite heavy on top, but that's because if he can keep it on the feet, he's laughing. He might get a bit troubled on if he goes to the ground. But I think he's got he's got quick hands for a light heavyweight. Medesk, that one two is one of his kind of good staple kind of one twos. Like we said off air, like the Redmond knockout, he got absolutely sparked there. But his take uh, takedown defense. You would like to think he's had been, he's been, it's something he's been working on. You'd like to think so. You, you would think it's something his team, his coaches, would certainly address. So I'd hope that he's turned it into a, an average defense. He doesn't have to do anything with it. As long as he can stop the takedown, it doesn't matter if he doesn't do anything else with it. Um, not bad st stamina either, so I'm going with Deskis as well. I think he's got the stamina to keep the feet, to keep the fight on the feet. I think Andreas can just miss and swing, and I think that's where Medeska can maybe counter to kind of hit the hit him when he's missing. So I'm going with Medeska with uh, probably a stoppage as well. And uh, super interesting fight next up in the featherweight division, though. Ricardo Ramos against Leon Mur uh, Laurent Murphy. Um, man, I like this fight a lot. Uh, I was a bit surprised when I saw because I thought Ricardo Ramos. I think if I looked at the ranking kind of situation, I thought I'd probably put him above Murphy by a bit, so I maybe would have thought give Ramos someone else. But um, interesting fight because Laurent Murphy kind of surprised everyone coming into the UFC with his debut, and and he he performed a lot better than a lot of us thought he could have done. And uh, I think that one of the biggest things here in this fight is if he can try and get the fight to the ground, Murphy maybe. But he's got a good power in his hands; he's, he can crack uh, Ramos. 
he's a very nice technician, he's got good footwork, uses his range well, he's in and out with footwork, and I like Ramos as a fighter, I've always liked Ricardo Ramos, I've always had a kind of, um, a lot of favoritism towards him, but I've just liked the way he fights, I just thought he's a good fighter, uh, but I, I'm, I'm going to go with the Brit this time, I think Laurent Murphy could maybe catch Ricardo Ramos, I know, um, I, 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 I don't know, I just kind of think, Maybe maybe the wrong he did well in his last fight. Maybe he could surprise some folk. Maybe he could pull out of the bag here. I'd, Ricardo Ramos is probably a heavy favorite, and, and rightly so. I think he's a very good fighter, and I think he could do. He's going to do very well. Four, what's he? Fourteen and two record or something. So, and he's on it. <clears throat> he, he's yeah. I've, I've, yeah, I'm going to go. With, God, I'm going to go Laurent Murphy. Fuck it. I'm going. To, I'm going for the going for the Brit. Maybe a little bit of a favoritism towards there, and a bit of affinity towards it. So. Maybe not the smartest choice, but I'm going to go Laurent Murphy. I think he could catch Ricardo Ramos with some strikes and keep it if he keeps it standing. Yeah, like I said, I think Laurent definitely he performed very well in his UFC debut against Tehugov, who has got that grappling heavy kind of game game plan and it can usually crack as well. Got taken down, but when he when he got back to his feet, he was landing some strikes and made that fight close and got a kind of dry to even though I thought Tehugov maybe deserved the, the nod in it. And to be fair, Murphy was a guy I, I really knew nothing about because in the UK, which is weird considering the amount of people that you do know coming through the scene, but he was one that completely went under the radar for me. Um, and I was kind of, I quite liked what I seen in his debut. And he's getting himself another big fight here against Ramos. So, um, and Ramos is the guy that I've, I've been a fan of since he came into the UFC way back in 2017, 2016, whenever it may be. And he's had some decent moments in the UFC octagon and moved up to 145. I've initially been down at 135. He's kind of grown into his body, kind of getting that man strength a little bit. And he's coming off two wins over Johnny Newsom and uh, Eduardo Garagori. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest... I think on the feet, this could be very competitive. I think Ramos sometimes overexerts himself and leaves himself open a little bit where Murphy could definitely capitalise. But the place where I think the biggest skill gap in here is here is on the ground. I think that if Hamels can get into a dominant position, I think he can find a submission. So I'm going to take Ricardo Hamels. I'm actually going to pick him via submission in this one. Okay, next up, another featherweight bout. Uh, Chris Fishgold, Jared Gordon. Interesting scenario that's happened. No one in the corner for Jared can rock up. So Paul Felder, who's going to commentate, is going to corner for him. He's got the oh. kind of been granted leave for that fight. So super interesting circumstances because you've got to think about who's going to be there to help him cut and weight and everything support the support network. I'm sure in a fight he's a professional. He's been around the block a few times, so he knows what's coming. But uh, Will Fishgold, Gordon. Uh, I've done an interview with Fishgold, folks. Again, if I'm not lazy, I'll put the little thing up there to watch it but I might forget so <laughs> yeah um, plus he's moving down to 145 again isn't he mm -hmm. uh, Jared Gordon so yeah. and the times that he's been down there before he's been he's been hurt uh, badly and that, that weight cut I think he's struggled with a couple of his weight cuts so I, I'm kind of a, a little bit wary about that um, I watched the Moret fight this morning and Moret's not super high level but he was giving him some problems initially the thing is with Fishy, the one thing that's always really put me off is just his gas tank a little bit. I think he goes for everything super hard and, and he leaves himself kind of open to gassing out a little bit. But he's got some skills on the ground and he's got some striking as well that can cause Jared Gordon problems. I just don't like this fight if it goes late for Chris Fishgold. Um, but he's very opportunistic with his submissions. If he, if he can jump on something, he will do it. But he can also be tapped out himself like Amakani who he's got he's he's one of those guys that's very opportunistic himself Amakani and actually really good mm -hmm. you've seen that against Danny Henry he's yeah. methodical in the way he gets his his subs um, and like I say I actually went back and watched the Calvin Cater fight when Chris came into the UFC and I was a little bit uh, I was like did he get run over in that fight and I was like well he actually came out through some decent strikes got a takedown early on but then he, they kind of, he just kind of gassed out really badly and against someone like Cater who's a prime, maybe even top five guy after this uh, this card if he wins. Um, that, that's a hard introduction to the UFC at any point. This one is all the the kind of lookings to me have been very, very close. If, if Fishgold doesn't get him out, then I think he could fade off. And it, it's weird seeing that because Fishy's fought five rounds before. Um, yeah. And defended his belt in, in that five round fight. So I think that, that and, and Jared Gord, I'm not never really been super high on him. Um, I think he's been given a lot of kind of big matchups initially in his UFC career. You've seen him against Hakran Diaz at the time, mm -hmm. who's um, kind of a named guy back then. 
Carlos David Ferreira, he's been there with uh, Charles Oliveira, so he's had some big names. Um, but like in saying that, you've got Amir Khani and someone like Qatar um, on the other side there for, for, for Fishgold. I'm going to pick Fishgold, maybe a little bit of, kind of bias on this one. I, I, I like Fishy a lot, but I, I see this being very close. I think if he doesn't get it done early, I think that Jerry Gordon could get him late. So I'm going to take Chris Fishgold, I'm going to take him via sub early round number two, but like I say, if it goes late, I think that Gordon takes it. Yeah, I think the, the, the thing for me with Fishgold is, as long as he can be a little bit patient and get the timing, like the, what he was doing against Samir Carney was absolutely dead on, like with those leg kicks as Samir Carney was coming in. He was really put, put, breaking up Amir Carney's kind of game plan on the feet, and I think if Fishgold hadn't taken that fight, if the fight hadn't went to the ground, he possibly could have went and won a decision there against Am, uh, Amir Carney on the feet, you know, for the three rounds, because Amir Carney just was not getting there. He just wasn't landing how he wanted to. He, it was, he could see he was getting a bit frustrated. Um, on this one, I think it's going to be a potential stand-up war. Fishgold's one to get involved in one of them as well. He'll be happy to kind of engage in it. Uh, I think as long as Fishgold can move after his strikes and not stay in the pocket too much, um, like you said, Will, one of the factors is what kind of weight cut will affect, or how will the sorry, weight cut affect Gerard, especially on the chin. As long as Fishgold can just keep the fight moving, keep it going, he should be okay in this. I'm, I'm going with Fishgold as well. I think he should be able to get the victory here um, and get himself a solid little win. If he hurts Gerard, he could maybe even get a submission. You know, he might jump on top of him and might go for a neck or something and try and get the sub. Don't be shocked at that. Or get the back because Fishgold is when he gets a choke on Fishgold's got a, a nasty choke. Like he is really wicked with that choke. So uh, do 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 take, take that into consideration. So I'm going Fishgold as well, bro. Next up, we have in the middleweight division, uh, change of opponent for John Phillips, but uh, unlucky. Uh, he's <laughs> John Phillips got Kamzat. Chemiv, who uh, who had been people had talked about him outside of the UFC as a you know potential future star. You know he trains at All Star Gym. He's got Savage after Savage after Savage surrounding him, and he's just a ridiculous talent. Like he is super. What was he? I think he's six and zero or something. But he's so talented for his for his for his six and zero record. He's he's he's, he's He's greater than a 6 and 0 record in that way with his skill set. Uh, John Phillips, to his credit, on social media, he's looking actually in shape rather than looking like a round shape as he tends to sometimes do. He looks like he's, you know, got conditioning in. He looks like he's got his nutrition sorted out a bit. John Phillips, you know what you're getting. He's bread and butter. Walks forward, swings heavy. Boxing, pretty much it. It's just he's just a boxer in, in the MMA game, um, but. He's fighting a guy in Kamzat who can strike, but he's an absolute monster on the grappling aspect. And I see here, John Phillips, he's never had a great takedown defense. He throws so heavy when he punches. He throws everything into his shots. The problem is with doing that, he's so open to the takedowns. I think um, Kamzat here can get, get the takedown, and he can either stop John Phillips with ground and pound or get a submission. I kind of open John Phillips up to get something, but... Man, I, I think John Phillips is going to have a rough night here. I think Kamzat should get the win, and he's a great addition to the middleweight division as well. Yeah, I, I was really surprised when I looked into Chimaev. I was like, oh, this guy. And I heard about him before, and I was like, okay. Like, uh, I seen that he went through Brave, and Brave, they're, they're sending yeah. some good fighters, and they'll yeah. give you decent fights in there. Uh, and then I watched him, I was like, this guy is going to, I think this guy is going to be really good. The only thing is he's 6-0 and uh, and he's mm -hmm. making a jump at the UFC against the guy in Phillips who's, he's been fighting big fights in Europe and the regional scene for a very, very, very long time. So, um, but he's very, very predictable as John Phillips. You know exactly what he's going to do. He's not going to come out here and do anything different. He's just a guy that wants to throw massive power shots. He's open to being counter to takedowns. And from what I've seen from Jimmy, if, if he can take him down and he can control him down there and he could submit him down there, he's coming in short notice, which is obviously another kind of red flag. It's it's never good, but if uh, he wasn't ready, he wouldn't taken taking this fight. So uh, I've got Jimmy. I think that um, as a favourite, he's lying pretty handily now. I think he should maybe lined even higher, but I've got him. I think he could submit John Phillips here, uh, and I think. I think that's probably what he does. I think it's going to be another submission victory for um, Kamzat Chimiev. Nice. Kicking off the main card, what we have here is uh, a man who's back after some issues with court. Let's put it that way. Uh, but he's found not guilty, so there you go. That's all needs to be said. Uh, Al Hassan, Abdul Razak Al Hassan is facing 
Is it Munir Lazir Lazir? Is it pronounced? Oh, Lazir, 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 yeah, Lazir. Uh, well, let me guess. You're thinking it's going to be a boring snooze fest decision. Yeah, I, I'm over the moon to see Al Hassan back because he is a destroyer. And I was thinking of this <laughs> actually when I, when I was watching some of his fights back in. Like I said, he came into the UFC as a an unknown guy, and I remember seeing him in Belfast. Yes, uh, the crowd were there, and we were we were in the crowd, and uh, when he was landing his shots, they were just like there was different noises to them. Yeah. I was like, oh my god, this guy absolutely th- like he he's got massive power, and then obviously he knocked out Charlie Ward, which at the, at the point to me wasn't a big shock that he knocked out Charlie Ward because he had no right whatsoever being in the UFC at all. So, um, but he's went on to to show that this guy has got like other worldly power. He's got some. He's got power in his hands that could knock a lot of people out mm-hmm. and bigger divisions as well. This guy is a, a power puncher, um, built very, very strongly, big legs, judo background. Uh, even in his loss, I thought he fought a really, really good fight as well. But Atmadov, he's a Russian grappler and he can tie you up and that's what he did in that fight there. Laziz isn't going to be the type of guy that's going to come out here and grapple. I just don't... I, I think Laziz is going to... He's going to see this guy in front of him and he's going to... He's, he, he's, I don't know what he's going to do because I don't think he's got the power or the, like, the, especially the one punch power to keep someone like Al Hassan back and if Al Hassan's in front of you and he's landing strikes and he throws with right and left um, and massive massive leg kicks as well it takes it doesn't even take a full shot once he's got you worried and he, the flurries that that guy throws in um, He's going to clip you with something, and you seen like Nico Price was just backed up, and he he had no other choice but to to sling leather back, which is the worst idea against a guy like this. <laughs> but in saying that, Lizzie's what I do like is he's, he's got lengthier, so if, and um, if he decides to kind of use that, and he, he can get himself into the fight and, and use his range and kind of pick it Al Hassan a little bit, maybe frustrate him. That's how he can win the fight. But the, the Lizzie's fights are watching like this a massive jump up against a guy mm. who has legit weapons. The guys you fought have not had legit weapons. He fought that, I think, is it Elderov, I think, and he looks like a good guy. He's got a really good record. It wouldn't surprise me if we've seen him in the UFC soon enough. Um, but Al Hassan, to me, is an absolute wrecking ball. And like I say, he has been out for a while. He had things outside of the cage. Um, so he might be a little bit rusty, so there may be this opportunity for Lizzie there. But I just think he's not going to be able to keep Al Hassan out of his wheelhouse here. And I think that he's just going to, he's going to get bombed on and I think he's going to get taken out very, very early in that first round. So I've got uh, Abdul Razak Al Hassan for a first round knockout. Well, there's not much to add. I've got Al Hassan as well. I just think he's, he's just, I think it's a, it's a, it, do you know what? I think it's a nice warm up return fight for Al Hassan. The UFC have given him with this fight matchup. Perfect fight for Al Hassan to come in, get a nice, Dust off the cobwebs, get a nice highlight reel finish, then give him up someone like like a Belial Mohammed or something. Do you know what I mean? Like give him a absolute cracking bomb bird. They might even give him um Joban. And now I'm not saying Joe Ban's and got the chin for it, but if you're trying to build Alisan, I just think a Joe Ban would be a nice one to do because he's Mike, out- Perry. Mike Perry, well they can't do that now, can they? <laughs> I'd well, give I'd give him Joe Ban because Joe Ban's gonna stand and strike. Yeah, that that wouldn't be. I, there's a lot of guys outside mm. that top fifteen um, that don't that, want him. That, that would get knocked. Like if you got the, the the contract through in your table that you mm. have to fight this guy, that's not a good look no. at all. You, you need something. You need something concrete in in your game, like mm. Atmadov, tough Russian so guy that can hold you down, yeah. take you down, and that's what he did to win that mm. fight. But even yeah. that was close. It was a split decision. So yeah. you you need a definitive. Mm. A skill set, something here, like a, a, being a good grappler or having just as much power or something to scare this guy to, to keep him back because if not, he's just going to bomb on you. And yeah. So I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Um, and I've also um, got a bet on him, which is uh, something we'll talk about at the end. Yeah, it is. And so, yeah, so I've, I've, the only reason I say Alisson is because he's got the grappling aspect, he's got the power. I, I just can't see it going any other way, folks. Really can't. Uh, next up, we're going to go with. The next fight on the flyweight women's flyweight division, Molly McCann against Talia Santos. Um, I actually had a bit of fun watching uh, the tape study for Talia Santos because um, I kind of just it just 
I kind of went. I couldn't quite remember fighting, and I went when when I went back to watch her fight. I went, do you know what? She's actually not a bad fighter. She's actually a legit good, she's got good striking. Um, and I think in this fight, Molly McCann is probably best just boxing with Talia. She's be best just sticking to the boxing, get in close, and just really kind of rain down. For me, sometimes Molly. She can slow down a bit in the later rounds because if she because she has got a bit of a high output. Um, now they're obviously going to have the air conditioning, so they should be okay for this fight card. Apparently, it's nice and cool in the arena and stuff like that. So that was one of my that was one of my original concerns with the fight, with not just for the fighters, but just like the pace it could maybe potentially keep up if it was going to be too uh, too much for them. But uh, Talia, yeah, she's you know she is a good fighter. She's got a good solid record, nice striking on it. She got umpteen fights cancelled up until this fight finally got put together the Barella fight she just got out grappled now I know that Molly McCann has been working on wrestling uh, I think since the Jillian Robertson fight really kind of just was the kind of bell ring for her to say look I need to sort this out and she's had uh, a lad at the gym who's like a, I think he's like in the Commonwealth Games or something a wrestler help her out at that place and help her with it if I was Molly McCann, I'd try to get a couple of takedowns against Talia Santos. I'd try and throw that in the mix just to get Talia thinking then. You know, you don't have to do much when you're on top of her, but just get a couple of takedowns, get get that in her head, and then when you start to throw the hands, it'll open up a little bit more because the hands have to be for Talia a little bit low. Um, I just think the aggression of Molly and the kind of pace that she can, can do, I, I'm going to go with Molly McCann here with like a decision win. I think she could maybe like get the first two rounds in. And then Talia would maybe get the. She could get. She could even pop around herself. But I've got a Molly McCann victory here. Yeah, this is this is kind of interesting to you because I think Santos is actually. I think she's a better technical striker than what McCann is. But when mm -hmm. you you have a look through her record, I mean, she's facing a lot of zero in this and zero in that coming out of Brazil, and she kind of got. No, I don't want to say she got exposed against Barella because it was. I thought a summer striking looked pretty crisp, pretty mm -hmm. nice. But she got clinched up. She got put against the cage. She didn't really know what she, what to do. She got taken down, um, and I think this is where Molly can can win the fight just by mixing it up because we know she's scrappy. Molly likes to get in a little bit of barn burner. She'll she'll throw hands as well, but she maybe has to kind of mind her p's and q's here with with Santos. Who, like I said, I think she's more technical. She's a little bit. I think she's pretty vastly uh, longer than her, like by six inches or something. This one, so mm. she can use that to her advantage. And we've seen outside the Gillian Robertson fight that she can grapple. And it's something that is definitely getting better. I mean, she times it well uh, and she can get the fight down there. So, um, Belbita, she, she she took a lot more strikes than that one. Even, even to be fair, the three fights that she's had that she's won, she's taken a lot of strikes. So, yeah. can, she can take a hit. But I think that's something that she needs to stop doing because the higher up this division you go, the more uh, kind of bigger hitters are, are just well, Shef Shevchenko, mate. You couldn't you yeah. couldn't get hit by that much. That oh, by could. Shevchenko, you wouldn't last. Yeah, but not even like like a Jessica I, I think would have. Yeah, would, could give her problems with boxing and, and so on. Um, so she gets hit too much with that. But I think she can mix it up here. So I'm going to take Molly McCann. I think it could end up maybe being a little bit close. But I like McCann. I'm a little bit kind of worried about her durability later on in the fight with Ricardo. Mm. But I think she might have a couple of rounds in the bank by then and. Um, Ultimately, she kind of wins the fight through through just kind of being more versatile in more areas. So I've got yeah. more to win. Next up, we have two bantamweight who just like their food and can't bother cutting for this one. They're facing each other at featherweight. Uh, Jimmy Rivera and Cody Stamen. Hey man, it's a it's a fun fight that they put together. I was I thought I liked it, and then I heard featherweight, and I went, I like it a little bit more because they're not having to bother cutting either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's like come together really short notice. Yeah. Like um, probably not even a week, maybe maybe in six days. So mm. um, they put this together really quick. It's a really well matched fight, and uh, I think it's one of these fights I can't. I, I really don't know if I've got the best read on. Um, mm. Obviously, Cody's coming off a massive win. I'm surprised he's fighting again so soon so after. So quick, yeah. Yeah. After what happened in his personal life and then obviously he fought yeah. very well against Brian Kelleher so I'm just really surprised that he's jumped back in there but I can see why it maybe keeps his mind off what's going exactly. on exactly we've seen that he kind of fought for his brother last time out and that maybe helped him through and then you've got Rivera who we've not seen in over a year he's coming off a couple of losses to probably the two top guys in the, in the division and to be fair I, I thought in Peter Yan's fights in the UFC he ran 
Peter Peter closest in 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 his fights in the UFC. So uh, very very good guy, good technical boxing. He's got re- a good like defensive wrestling. He can get takedowns as well, and he can also crack. He can hurt you, and he mm-hmm. can make with good low kicks and so on. Stamen to me, um, I think it's a technical strike. I think Rivera's got him there. I think Stamen can maybe have a little bit more output. Um, but he has got a short reach, which kind of worries me. I think as a wrestler, I think Stamen's really, really good. I think he, he's another guy, like we're speaking with Molly McCann. I think he can maybe mix it up a little bit more, but mm. Jimmy Rivera, is, he's a tough, tough guy to really look good against. Um, not unless you're someone like Aljo, who was using his range beautifully in that fight and just um, picking him apart with kind of solid movement and so on. Um, but he's beat some legit guys in this division. I mean... When you've got wins over uh, Alcantara, Thomas Almeida, Pedro Munoz, John Dodson, they're decent, decent wins. Um, and Cody, like I say, both guys moved up to, to 145, which I like here. Cody's one of those guys that will always stick around the top 15, in my opinion. He'd probably be a maybe even a gatekeeper at this point, but um, like I say, I thought his striking looked as good as ever last time out. I think he could mix up. I think he might struggle a little bit with the grappling to get the fight to the mat. If he does, I think I can see a review popping up. Not got a good read in this fight, but I'm going to take Cody Stamen in a very, very close split decision win. But I'm I'm looking forward to seeing Rivera again. Rivera's a, a, a fun fighter to watch. Yeah, it is. When you see here Jimmy's name get called out, you always know what you're going to get. I'm going to go with Jimmy Rivera in this one. Um, I'm going with it on the premises of, even against Aljo, mean, still, he did really good in the takedown defence against Aljo. Aljo had a tough time getting him down. Um and Jimmy's got the low centre of gravity, and I think Cody's going to have a tough time getting it to the ground as well, because Jimmy's got a good, solid base for take, uh, takedown defence. Uh, and this is where like the range and the striking side comes into it then. I think Jimmy had an issue with the, 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 the kind of Aljo side of it, because he just couldn't get his... He couldn't get going. He was even saying between rounds, he says, I just... I feel flat. It just felt. It just. It was one of those nights, the the worst kind of nights you have, where you just don't turn up. Um, and I think with the Cody fight, he he'll be able to turn up a bit more because he'll be able to find his range. He'll be able to get his striking and, and get moving like that. And I, and the problem with Jimmy Rivera is you don't want him to get going because he's a uh, he's a bit of a terror. And like you say, the Peter Yan fight. Oh, that's such a fun fight to watch. And, and, and Jimmy Rivera is one of those guys, I think he can, I think he might be able to hurt Cody on a striking, and I think he'll be able to stop the takedown. So I think I'm going to go with Jimmy on a decision as well. I think Cody might get one round with a take, couple of takedowns in, maybe in the later part of the round or at the start in the first when they're not as sweaty, but I'm going to go Jimmy Rivera on this one. Um, co-main event I have down here at the moment is Tim Elliott against Ryan Benoit, uh, or Benoit if you're a WWE fan. Uh, but yeah, I've, man, I'm kind of, I'm kind of questioning Tim Elliott these days, and it, it kind of sucks because he's such a fun dude to watch, and I kind of think nowadays I'm like, is his chin not what it was? Like, as in, he's getting hit a bit too much these days. His conditioning went out the window in his last fight. Don't know what's going on there. How did Tim Elliott get tired in the first in one round? That was just. I, I don't know. I can't. I don't know what happened. I can't. I watched it, and I had to actually watch it twice because I had to maybe see if maybe he got hit in a solar plexus or something. And there wasn't anything in particular that stood out. So I don't know what happened that night where he gassed, and I went, "Well, he would have been conditioned to fight. There's no way he'd just be un, not fit to fight." So that doesn't make sense. He obviously made the weight, so the weight cut. He got down the weight. No idea. So it worried me that bit. Obviously, the um, Ashkov fight. He got. He got. I think he got knocked out on his feet and came back too, which was crazy. Ryan Benoit is a guy who's like not amazing at anything, but he is growing. And I think, could Ryan here maybe hurt Tim Elliott on the feet? Because Ryan Benoit could crack. I, I have, I'm going to go with Ryan Benoit because I'm, I'm just a bit worried at Tim at the moment. I'm just not sure where Tim is. I'm sure because of his last performance, that's why he's coming back so quick. He's a bit annoyed with himself and wants to get back in there and just get it, try and dust it off. But I was just a, you know, just a couple of little signs, you know, got rocked on his feet prior and, and this. And I've, I'm sure he, theoretically, if this Tim should win, but I'm going to go with Ryan Benoit because I think Ryan might be able to hurt Tim and actually cause Tim problems in the fight. I think if he can keep the fight standing, Ryan and can hurt him. Tim might have a rough night. Uh, he's he's definitely hittable, Tim, because he's so unorthodox, but he is there to be hit. 
if you look at the uh, Ashcroft fight, he, he was able to crack him quite hard and get him a few times. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm going to Ryan Benoit, mate. I'm not. I, I don't think I can trust Tim Elliott anymore. Mm. Honestly, I, that that was a massive surprise to me last time that he gassed out, and when I was like, yeah. and against someone like Royval, Royval's got a lot of flaws in his game, but he's super yeah. dangerous. Um, and he, he just kind of ran into to the wheelhouse of, of Royval and, and got submitted there. But um, it's hard to be really confident in either guy here, in my opinion. I've bet on Benoit in the past, and he's, he's not looked good. And then there's times when he's knocked out guys. So um, I think one's 10 and 6. I think uh, Benoit's 10 and 6. Then you've got someone like mm. um, Tim Ellis, like 4 and 9 in the UFC. I mean, that's not that's not a good look, having a record like that in the kind of premier kind of mixed martial arts company. Um, he can get takedowns. I think he will get takedowns. But he's not a guy to really hold people there. So I can see Benoit getting back in the feet. And I think on the feet, Benoit's more technical and just a better striker. Uh, and you've seen like, someone like Askarov, who's really not known for his hands, catch him with a big shot, put him down. Um, so I'm going to go Ryan Benoit as well, even though it, it could be a, it might look a bad pick. Mm. But um, I've got no confidence in yeah. Tim Elliott at this point. I think um, he he looks kind of well. I don't want to say the word washed up, but um, you can see he's, he's a prototypical kind of veteran of the sport and of the division. But um, I, I'll go Ryan Benoit, but like not confident at all. Uh, we have now the main event. Uh, hey. Like the matchup, mate, when it got matched up. It's a good one. It's a nice, fun fight. Calvin Qatar against Dan Ige. Dan Ige's on that continuous rise, and Calvin Qatar is just an absolute monster, you know, to face anyone. And that win over Jeremy Stevens stands out, but will. Who's going to win, though, bro? Uh, I like the fight. I'm surprised that Ige's jumping back in there so quick because, mm. I mean, he, he fought very, very recently. He took a lot of kind of damaging blows in that one. And. Uh, but the, the victory in that one, even though I was on the opposite side in Barboza, I thought Barboza did enough to win that fight, but cannot take away anything from Dan Ige because he fought his, he fought his heart out and really kind of went after it and really stayed in there with one of the kind of more dangerous guys, no matter what division it is, because Barboza is a bit of a wrecking machine on um, on, on the feet. And it showed initially in that fight. Then you, then you move into this one here, you've got, kind of got Calvin Keir who's coming off a, a brutal knockout of Jeremy Stevens. He caught him with that beautiful elbow, which was just nasty. He, he's a guy to me that starts a little bit slow, picks his shots, but his boxing, his technical boxing, his shot selection is beautiful. It really, it's been a mainstay since he came into the UFC um, when he fought Andre Philly and beat Andre Philly. If you're coming into the UFC and beating a guy like that straight off the bat, it says a lot about uh, you as a fighter, in my opinion, taking out a guy who's probably kicking around that top 20 there. And he's got great output, um, hard to take down. I think he, he can get takedowns as well, even though I think Ige is probably the more superior guy with his jiu-jitsu and so on. Nice. But he's got some vicious knockouts. He's got some beautiful boxing skills. Uh, and he's beat legit guys. I mean, Lama, yeah. Stevens, Burgos, Feely. This guy's not really had any fights. Maybe outside... Um, the fish gold fight, which for, for fish gold, that's a rough kind of introduction to the UFC. Uh, he's fought good guys, went to Russia, fought to beat if that was five rounds. He wins that fight, in my opinion. Um, I think Ige likes to maybe take some breaks in the kind of middle of parts of rounds where Qatar I don't think is going to let him kind of get off the hook and uh, he's going to make him kind of pay in those exchanges. I think just the technical boxing is eventually going to catch up. And I think that he's going to knock out Dan Ige kind of in the fourth or the fifth round. So um, I've got Boston's finest and Calvin Cater to win via TKO in the later rounds. Yeah, I'm with Calvin all day on it. I just think that he's, like you say that, one thing he said himself was he wants to try and become a little bit quicker off the mark in the start of fights because he feels that sometimes he's a bit slow getting off. But one of the things, is, I don't think it's that he's slow. He just reads guys in the fight. And that's where, like you say, where we see his boxing then just come along. Like in the fish goal fight is a good example. He was getting hit by fish goal. Then also he just started to see the gaps and that's where he fought. And then he hit them. The Jeremy Stevens fight. Jeremy Stevens came out like a bull. Came straight at him, swinging. Obviously, I think that was the fight where Jeremy missed weight. But came at him, swinging heavy hard. And Calvin, you know, got hit a couple of times. Moved out of the way. Just, But then he started to see where those gaps were. And then he just went, right, I've got you now. And I think that's going to be the same thing here. I think Danny Gay ideally needs to close the distance. 
I think Calvin's got better footwork than, for example, Danny Hendry, who was a similar build to Calvin with the, the kind of long body. I think he'd be able to, I think Calvin be able to get out of the way of those shots a lot better, but I think he's got a far better striking than Danny Henry and can land heavy and harder. I think uh, Calvin will, and he rips the body so nicely as well. Like, he just mixes the combinations up. I think, like, I think, you know, third round, maybe fourth round, I think he'll start ripping the body in the se uh, first second it will start to take a toll. It'll open up upstairs, and then Ige might not make it that far. So I'm, and especially Ige getting that this split over Edson got the split over Betsik. It's only so far you can go with splits. You know what I mean? There's only there's only so far you can get in this game, going up the ranks to get to get those Ws, man. And I think he might just fall short here. So I'm going Calvin as well. Um, and that's our picks. Like we say, quick, short, condensed one. We're going to go on to the bets now, Will. You're going to give us the bets that we've got, folks. Again, if you've got any bets yourself, put them in the comment section below. Let us know who you're going for, if you're doing DraftKings, whatever you've got. And by all means, hit that subscribe button as well while you're here. Yeah, I think it's a, a really good bet in Cardiff, some sports here. I might as well come out and say I've got my, probably my biggest bet. I think it is my biggest bet in MMA uh, ever in Al-Hassan. Uh, I've unloaded as much <laughs> unload on a fighter. Um and Al Hassan here, I just think that he he really beats this kid up and gets him out there in the first round. So uh, minus two hundred, I threw the kind of everything on as much as as I would in a, a spot like that. Um, the other lines I'm liking, like over here in the UK, I'm looking at American lines, but uh, in America she's minus one twenty. Over here in the UK she's an underdog at plus one hundred, slight dog. Uh, Molly McCann is something that I might actually make this bet in the next hour while that line's still around here mm -hmm. at Betfair. Um, the other line that I'm looking at is Jack Shaw inside the distance at minus 110, which I'm like, the way that Jack Tasty. guys uh, and what I've seen from from uh, Aaron Phillips where he can be taken down, I think it kind of plays in the wheelhouse of Jack Shaw. Um, I, I, I like that bit a little What's, bit. What's uh, Kenneth odds, mate? Uh, he's minus one seventy, but like oh, that's not yeah, bad. Yeah, it is, but it's like I can't really trust. It wouldn't surprise me if Gonzalez mm -hmm. beats him. I think it's just low, kind of low, low level. But yeah. there's definitely a path to victory for Kenneth Berg. But um, the other kind of spots I'm looking at is Chimiev, maybe parlaying up with someone else and a different card. But like I said, I picked my fair share of dogs. There's Chris Fishgold at plus one thirty. Don't think I can go there. Corey Stamens plus 115. Think I, I don't think I'm going to go there. So I actually like Ricardo Ramos at minus 155. I think if he keeps getting bet down, that might be a straight bet for me in that spot there. What's uh, Elliot and Ben Benoit, by the way? Elliot is a minus 115. Benoit's one minus 105. So pretty much a pick him. No Fair surprise enough. there, really. Yeah. So, Fair uh, but like I say, I think my mainstay plays in this one is Al Hassan. I'm, obviously heavy in him mm -hmm. Molly McCann and uh, I, I like Jack Shore inside the distance I just think if he gets him to the ground because I mean that no no, no healing Hernandez fight his entries and his takedowns were so good and like his control in the bottom was mm. so good and I think Hernandez um, I think that uh, Phillips I just don't think he'll hang with someone like Jack Shore who's a black belt on the ground so um, that's kind of where I'm moving um, for this card but I mean, someone has just absolutely unloaded a bet on Calvin Cater because that line's just moved massively. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he was minus 275 at the start of this at 10 o'clock and now he's minus 330. So someone's unloaded in Calvin Cater, which, oh, that's literally not long happened. So, uh, yeah, I, I you could use him as a parley piece. Money's going to come in in Dan Ige. I've got no doubt about that because mm -hmm. plus 270, in my opinion's off. I think that line is off, considering how Danny Gay fights, and he's a, a, always a live underdog. So makes it close. Yeah. So I'm going to take uh, a couple of bets I've got there, and um, maybe, maybe we'll see if I, I add a couple more. Maybe parlay in someone from here and someone else from another card in the future. Okay, nice one, Will. Ladies and gentlemen, like we said before, give us your picks and your bets down below. Hit that subscribe button. We'll be back again shortly because we're literally going to record the next card after this. So that's why our clothes don't change, just in case you wonder. We're not scruffy tramps. Uh, thanks for tuning in and uh, enjoy the next show, folks.